Det är inte gott. Jag är svårt att gott, pjur Katrina. Kan du det här? Nej, jag är chint här med horst. Katrina, jag är chint. Jag är kvar här. Har vi en vapen? Jag är kvar här. Har vi en vapen? Jag My name is Catherine McEachern. Okay, and where were you brought up? I was brought up at Westlake Ainsley. Great. And uh, can you tell me some of your genealogy? My mother, her, her people came from Loch Haber in Scotland. Uh -huh. And my father's people were from the Isle of Egg. Okay. And uh, uh, do you know... Uh, what year they might have arrived? I can't really say for sure, but I would be, I would guess it would be in the uh, 1900s. Oh, the, I think the, the yeah, prior to. Prior to the 1900s. Right. And uh, where did you go to school, Catherine? I went to school from uh, primary to grade eight, to grade nine, rather, at uh, Tullock School at Westlake Ainsley. Okay. And from there, I went to Port Hood Academy, and from there to St. Joseph Comet in Mabi. And uh, was there any Gaelic taught or spoken in the school when you were uh, going? No, there wasn't any Gaelic. In those days. Uh, but there was Gaelic in the homes. There was Gaelic at our house. My father and mother spoke Gaelic very fluently, and uh, we absorbed some of the Gaelic just from listening to it, but not speaking it very, very much, mm -hmm. except for fun. Right. Well, uh, like I said, our parents, my parents spoke it very fluently, and uh, when people came to visit, they too spoke Gaelic. So there was a lot of conversation went on when we had uh, little Kayleys at our house. Mm -hmm. And um, if we um, went to a concert, maybe in Brook Village or in Glencoe, or visited our relatives in Glencoe, there was um, a lot of Gaelic uh, shared in the conversations. And even in the singing, there was a lot of singing went on. My father liked to sing Gaelic songs. Yes. And my mother too. Good, and we're going to hear uh, him singing uh, on the recording we have, which is good, and that's uh, coming up a little later in the interview. Uh, so you, you joined the choir, uh, Kasher and Ellen. Yes, I did. And uh, what year was that you joined the choir? In 1992. Okay. And uh, another sister and myself, Sister Claire Bean, were... Uh, approached by Maureen McKenzie, who was the director of Kasha Ganelli. And um, she gave us all kinds of reasons why we should join this choir. And we were both kind of shy about saying yes to this uh, invitation. But if you knew Maureen McKenzie, you didn't say no to Maureen. And I, I have to say that I'm very happy that I uh, accepted her invitation because it's been a nice experience for me. Got to know a lot of nice people, a lot of good laughs, and uh, making use of a talent I didn't know I had, really. Good. And you, you meet lots of nice people yes. at the uh, events you attend. Yes. Uh, what, for instance, last summer uh, you performed in some concerts? Yeah. Every every summer from from May until October, we're very busy entertaining at different events, and we uh, have a practice every Wednesday night in the cafeteria at our convent in Mabel. Mm -hmm. And now that dear Maureen has gone to heaven, Father Alan McMillan is our capable director, and we enjoy him very much. He's got a good sense of humor. He accepts us with our mistakes and our good points. And tells us that he always tells us we're doing a great job. Good. Uh, do you recall uh, people visiting your home uh, at 
like Ainsley, uh, telling stories and and uh, speaking Gaelic in the, in the Gaelic language. Very much so. Uh, our relatives from Glencoe, your father and mother being two of them, and Aunt Peggy and Sadie and Janangas, they came often came on Sundays after Mass. And we would go to Glencoe to, to uh, return the visit. And it was always Gaelic that was, was uh, shared in the storytelling and in all the good news that they, we heard since we had, since uh, winter was over and people shared a lot of the things that happened during the winter because we didn't travel very much in the winter because of uh, transportation in those days wasn't as plentiful as it is today. That's right. And uh, some of the stories were, were passed down uh, from generations that they told. Uh, I recall myself, uh, Aunt Christy, uh, was able to recall some of the fairy tales that were told to her yes. by our great grandmother, yes. Christy O'Hanley. Oh, yes. And do any of your family members, uh, your sisters or your brothers, or your brother, did they speak Gaelic? No, not any more than I did, and that wasn't very much. Okay. And then, but like myself, they, they understood it. Yes. Uh, so you have some nieces in Detroit that, that sing. Yes. So they're talented in that way. Yes. Uh, they enjoy the Cape Breton music, too. That's right. Yes. And your brother was very, is very fond of uh, music and dancing. Yes. And he's a great patron of the dances. When he comes home in the summer, he attends uh, every dance he can and uh, enjoys the, the fiddle music and uh, in a lot of cases knows the history of some of these tunes. And uh, although he doesn't claim to be a singer, my sister used to say that when no one was around, you should hear him singing, and he had a good tenor voice, she said. Oh, good. And I tell him that. I said, you should be using that tenor voice. He said, who told you I had a good tenor voice? <laughs> so, anyway, getting back to the, the dancing, he, my brother was not a step dancer, but he enjoyed square dancing. Yes, very much. And still does. Yeah. And your sister, Chrisabel, yes. uh, she's a great storyteller herself. She's very detailed in her storytelling. So. Yes. And she, uh, and Teresa, my sister, could step dance. She was a good step dancer. That's right. But she got, out of, she got out of practice, I guess, when she moved to the big city. That's right. <laughs> and one story that Christabel shared with me was uh, when your parents first moved home from Detroit uh, and they found this farm in Lake Ainsley that was available. And there was uh, a house guest at your place at the time. Yes. Do you remember his name? D.F. McDonald. D.F. McDonald. And he owned the house? He owned the house, yes. And uh, he was interested in getting a young couple to come to live there. And they, uh, the parish priest at the time knew D.F.'s wishes. And when he heard that my father and mother moved home from Detroit, it was during the Depression, and they, my father was working at Ford's and my mother was doing uh, housework. And uh, when the Depression came, they decided they had to make a move. So they came back to uh, Glen Cove. They lived in Glen Cove, the old place there, with, with my grandparents. And at the time, Father McPherson was the pastor in uh, Good village in Glencoe and Westlake, and he advised them to uh, to go to visit DF, and they did, and um, they made an agreement to to buy the farm for a very reasonable price, and um, with the with the agreement that they would look after him until his death. So he lived for two years after they moved there. And uh, my sister, Chris, had the job every day of bringing him his breakfast in the morning. Yes. And this particular morning, she brought him his tray to his room. And after a while, she went back to claim the uh, tray. 
and discovered that he had died mm -hmm. after he had his breakfast. So, and he left the cup turned upside down on the train wow. very appropriately. Yes. So she often told that story about how um, that was. But they liked him very much. He was like a grandfather to them. Yes. Very kind. That's a great story and a great piece of history. Yes, it is. To know. Uh, people cared for one another in those days. Yes, they did. Yeah. Yes. So were there many picnics or concerts in your area when you were growing up? Every year at uh, Westlake Ainsley they had a, uh, a picnic and it was in connection with the parish and uh, that brought people from all around to come and join in the celebration. They come from River Dennis, Glencoe, Judic and uh, we often, uh, although I don't remember them, I used to hear my father and mother talk about uh, people they met at, at these events and the, the good time they, they had seeing people and seeing new people that they wouldn't have had the chance to see if there wasn't a gathering like that. Right. And uh, at the concerts, were there Gaelic singing and, uh, and skits? I'm not so sure of the skits, but I know there was a lot of um, Gaelic singing. That was the, the entertainment. Mm -hmm. Storytelling was uh, very prominent. Mm -hmm. And we used to put a Christmas concert on in sco at school. And I can remember uh, preparing the school, the Tullock School at the lake, uh, preparing it, preparing the, the stage for the event. And we'd bring uh, white sheets from our beds at home and hang them up and uh, provide the uh, uh, background for our uh, concerts. <laughs> we had a lot of fun doing that. Okay. We had no accompany to, accompaniment to our music, but we uh, made do with just singing, yes. singing the best of our ability. Good. And we yeah. have someone uh, act as Santa Claus. That was always a, a lot of fun things. And we'd have fudge sales uh -huh. to make a little money for, for the school. Right. And uh, they used to have box parties in, in like Ainsley. Yes. I think they still do, do they? Yes, they do. Every year. In the summer, in July. The last weekend in July, they have a, a dance and a box social. Uh -huh. And that brings people together. And uh, they have a lot of good laughs and meeting the tourists that come home for the summer. Right. So, uh, some of your own work history, Catherine, um, I know you mm -hmm. uh, you joined the CNDs. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What year you joined and the name of the congregation? Okay, I joined in 1954 and um, I went to Montreal for a I initiate, and uh, that was kind of a, it was an interesting and a hard experience in that it was interesting in the sense that I was getting to know, uh, meet new people, but the French language was foreign to me, but I discovered after three or four months being immersed in the French language that I was getting very good at speaking French. In fact, when I tried to speak Gaelic, I often mixed the, Ga the French words with the Gaelic. But I often thought there is a similarity between a lot of the words in, in the Gaelic language uh, as co when I compare it to the French language. Interesting. So that might be something we have to investigate. I don't That's know. Right. So you taught school okay, after, after that experience? After my uh, profession in 1956. Uh, another sister and I were asked to, were named to go to the teacher's college in Truro for our teacher training. And uh, in 1957, I came to um, to the pier in Sydney, Holy Redeemer, and I taught for 13 years at uh, a little school called Villanova. And that was just a very good experience. I had a nice principal, she was a sister, 
and she taught me a lot about care of our children and taking responsibility for laying the foundation for their future. And um, I, I, that's one of the things I'm very grateful for. And after leaving um, the pier, I went for four years to Larry's River and taught grades five and six at a little community called Whitehead. And that was a nice experience as well. Then I was asked to go back to Sydney where I taught at St. Joseph's School for six years. And following that, I went, I was invited to come to, to Marvel because my parents had moved from the farm at West Lake and uh, settled at the senior citizens in Marvel. And I'm always grateful for that experience because not only did I uh, continue my teaching career, but I was also able to be of help to them as they grew older. Yes. And they, my teaching took me to Judic, where I taught for eight beautiful years. And that's where I ended my teaching career. And uh, that was 1977, if I recall, when you uh, moved from Sydney to Marble. Because that winter, your parents uh, stayed in Glencoe. That's right, yes. Uh, they made the move at, uh, from the farm. Her parents' place, yes. my former home. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, there's some interesting Gaelic stories and songs oh, from that uh, period, yes. too. And when they moved to Mabu, they had a lot of nice experiences. I remember the CBC came to Mabu and set, set up at the fire hall in Mabu, and all the seniors from the area were invited to go to, to be taped and to be uh, sharing stories and to be singing. And uh, my father... One day when I was in Sydney, I heard this tape on the radio and I said, that sounds like my father. And here it was, it was truly his voice that I was hearing. Oh, wonderful. So now we're going to hear uh, a recording that was made of uh, your father, John Alec McEachern, uh, in the uh, 70s, I believe, or early 80s. In the 80s, I would say. Early 80s. And it was uh, one of the recordings made by John Shaw, yes. which is available on galestream.ca. And it's, it's a very good recording of him. And uh, we're going to listen to it shortly, but we're going to show a picture of, of John Alec and uh, your mother, Aunt Flora. So we're going to zoom in on them. This is their wedding picture taken in Detroit. In 1926. In 1926. That's quite a photo. And you have another photo there too you want to share. And it's a later uh, photo of them. And do you know where the photo was taken? It was taken in St. Joseph's Convent in Mabo on the occasion of her, of their uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Okay, and who's in the picture? Can you just... In the front are my father and mother, John Alec and Flora. And in the back are Uncle Huey McDonald from Glencoe Mills and Aunt Christy, who is Christy Walsh from Port Hood. That's right. Aunt Christie was their bridesmaid when she when they were married, and um, Campbell from Judic was their groomsman, but he's since departed, deceased, so Uncle Huey stood in for him for the anniversary. For the anniversary, great, and he happens to be my father, so yes. that's nice to see that picture again. Thank you for sharing that. So now we're going to sit back and listen to uh, John Alec. Ringantaren, <laughs> 
ulak mas pahaga vi a shomar va ko yu shomar va feunete sauri loroma aire lore aire lere aire lore ga kwe mare rare koro warsale she nachra beinse warishka ma He was from Hillsdale, Hillsdale right? and he was uh, from the family with the Swanyag in Wachin. Yeah, and when he went to when he started school, he he didn't speak any English. That's right. But eventually he became bilingual. Good. And uh, uh, your mother Flora. Uh, she had a lot of talent too. Yes. She was a very resourceful woman. Yes, very hard worker. Yes. And uh, 
very good at knitting and sewing and cooking. And uh, she could sing too. Yes, very much. And she knew a lot of songs and uh, stories. And she was very precise in her storytelling and in her genealogy. Every detail was considered. Yes. I think that year that she and my father spent in Glencoe before they went to settle in Mabu uh, reinforced that love of the Gaelic language, uh, that they were able to share it with your mother and father. Too. Yes. They did a lot of singing and telling stories. Yes, that was a, a great benefit to me as well. Yes. I remember that. And uh, I think, too, when they moved to Mabu, uh, my father prided himself in learning to read more Gaelic than he ever had had time to do it when he was working on the farm. That's right. And uh, often I'd drop in to see them on my way home from teaching at Judy, and I'd find my father reading out of the uh, Mabu Pioneers and, and my mother as well. And a lot of people came to, to visit them to trace relationships with the different people. So they were usually correct with the information they got. That's good. Thank you, Catherine. Now, in our next segment, uh, we're going to hear a song from yourself that uh, I know will be uh, much appreciated. And now I'm going to sing one of my favorite songs, Autumn Kepeti. I hear it sung often by Alice Freeman. She often uses it to uh, entertain at the her her Kaylees in Inverness in the summer, and uh, a lot of people enjoy joining in the chorus because it's a an easy uh, chorus to to sing. She kepre tin chim o glai chim an cruz na mel de nat she kepre tin chim o glai chim sari oin er hao sal of ami ansen now con i gau ne chim an bel gat sa hab o gali gau ni mi vau du chir nan glenan che ke prai ti chir mo glai chir nan krus na mel de nat che ke prai ti chir mo glai chir is ai ne roi ne hao an u din gas ke le u is on a mer shachos an chir stat i mi bon ha mi ski ben a chlai vis ai ha valu she ke preit in chir mo glai chir nan krus nan baun tan hart she ke preit in chir mo glai chir is an e lai ne hao she ke preit in chir mo glai Cheer and curse the mountain heart. Shake a prey to cheer more cry. Cheer is I need a little hope. And thank Papalit to you, Pauline, for accompanying me on that course. I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> Agus, uh, can you tell me now uh, if you have a favorite Gaelic song? I think I just sang it. I really enjoyed that song because it uh, takes in the whole of Cape Breton. Yes. I would have liked to have sung more, but that's my bucket list. I'm going to learn them all. <laughs> all the verses. And uh, you sing quite a few with Kasha and Ellen. Yes, and I enjoy that very much. When you sing with a choir, you uh, can cover up a little bit on the words that you're not sure of. But it's an enjoyable event because everyone seems to be happy and enjoying what they're doing. And very 
interested in keeping the uh, the Gaelic language alive. There's a great spirit in the group, and I want to pay tribute to them. Of course. And to their and to the fact that Maureen began that wonderful group, and uh, we get a lot of nice comments on our singing. In mm -hmm. fact, we made a little CD a few years ago on it, and I often play it, and I say, "Did we do that? That's a very good job we did. I'm very proud of it." So maybe someday we'll come up with a, a better one, better CD. It's good. And and the, the group is still intact, and intact, that, that's, yes. that's very important. And too. we're getting new members every year. That's right. I guess when they hear, hear us sing, they say they want to be part of it. So. And nice. very supportive of, of the Gaelic efforts oh, yes, in, in Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia. And uh, strong connections to Scotland, too. So were you ever in Scotland, Catherine? No, but uh, it's on my bucket list since a few years. Mm -hmm. What part would you like to see first? You know? I, I'd like to go to um, Loch Arbor. Yeah. I'd like to go to Barra because um, at our center we had visitors from Barra at our place and they were such so happy to be over here, especially the time of year they came was in September and they were very happy to uh, enjoy the beautiful scenery, thanks to the maple leaves that were turning colors. And they really, they don't have trees like uh, like the maples over in, in, in Scotland. And uh, they enjoyed coming to uh, partake of the beauty that surrounds them in, in the areas around Cape Breton. They were over in Iona and uh, different visited different areas of Cape Breton while they were staying with us in Mabu. And I think some of them are coming back this year. I, I'm hearing that there's a group coming. Good. Very nice people. Uh, so what uh, sort of changes have you seen over the years, Catherine, regarding uh, the Gaelic language? Well, for one thing, I see a great interest in among the young people in learning the Gaelic language, and I think that's a wonderful thing, that they, uh, they're they happy to, to learn the language, to uh, do skits in the Gaelic language, to sing, and to they take part in, uh, in da square dancing and step dancing and learning all those nice traditions that maybe would have been lost if they, if they weren't picked up by these young people. And I, I appreciate the generosity of these young people because they uh, are always willing to share their talents. And I want to pay tribute to two people in particular who have kept that spirit alive. And they are um, Effie Rankin, who came from Scotland, and um, Margie Beaton, who through the school system, in, in both cases with Effie and, and uh, Margie, they uh, got an interest in this teaching the Gaelic to the young people because if it's going to be continued, it has to be done by, by these young people. Great. Uh, so what uh, future do you see for, for Gaelic in the years to come? I see a great future because there's a great enthusiasm among the young people today and there's an enthusiasm on part of the old people to encourage young people to be learners and doers. Uh, do you have any, any other uh, comments to make or add today? Well, I would like to uh, thank you, Pauline, for inviting me to be part of this uh, undertaking. And uh, I'm happy to be able to um, do my part to uh, keep the spirit of the Gaelic culture alive. And every time I uh, take part in a concert, I'm very happy to, to do it in memory of the, my father and mother and my all my relatives who did a good job of keeping the Gaelic alive as long as they could. So I pay tribute to them and I express gratitude for having this opportunity to do so. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. More than thank uh, Katrina. I guess, I mean, Darkest could be uh, uh, Gaelic Galeo Racket. <laughs> and it's on Gleanachin uh, Sachin. <laughs> Tapley. <laughs>